Good evening, good evening. Come on in. It's time for Bible study. Come on in. Good evening, good evening, good evening, come on in. Good evening, Sister T. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Good evening, Sister Linda Barton. Good evening, Sister Dent. Good evening, Sister Linda Thompson. Good evening, good evening, good evening. Come on in. Come on in. Say good evening when you come in the room. Say good evening when you come in the room. Amen, amen, amen. Go ahead and say good evening. Go ahead and say good evening when you come in the room. I pray you have had a uh, blessed day thus far. Good evening, Sister Carol Williams. See you coming on in. Amen. About you, but I am excited about this lesson on tonight. As we prepare to dive into God's word on tonight. Amen. So good to see each and every one uh, of you sharing with us tonight. Uh, we'll begin tonight uh, with our affirmation. Mount Olive is an awesome church with awesome people doing awesome work for an awesome God. Amen. Amen. And of course, we always want to begin with a reminder of our mission statement. Our mission is to magnify God, uh, practice evangelistic outreach, pursue spirit, layer unity, meet family needs, and present sound Bible teaching. Good evening, Sister Cynthia Oliver. So good to see you on. Uh, with us this evening. Um, as we prepare to study and look at the book of uh, Exodus on tonight, uh, let's prepare our hearts by going to God in sincere prayer. Good evening, uh, Lashana Richardson. God bless you. Thank you for sharing. Let's go to God in prayer tonight uh, before we get started. 
Most gracious and eternal God, our Father, Lord, we come now uh, saying thank you for your word. God, we thank you for being with us and bringing us to this space. Uh, we pray now, Spirit of the living God, that you would fall fresh on us. Open our hearts that we might receive your word. Open our ears that we might hear from you. Open our eyes and our minds that we might see. God, we thank you now. Thank you for fresh wisdom. Thank you for fresh knowledge and fresh understanding of your word. Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. And we give you all of the praise, all of the honor, and all of the glory. In your son's matchless, marvelous, and magnificent name, we pray. Amen. And thank God. Amen. And thank God. So good to see uh, each and every one of you all sharing with us on tonight. Uh, so excited to get started tonight uh, as we will be looking at uh, the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. Get up. Leave. Take off. These words are good ones for those trapped or enslaved. Some resist their marching orders, however, preferring present surroundings to a new unknown environment. My brothers and sisters, it's not easy to trade the comfortable security of the known for an unknown or an uncertain future. But what if God is giving us marching orders that it is time to move? Will we follow God's lead? Exodus describes a series of God's calls and the responses of God's people. So we'll begin tonight by looking at some of the vital statistics, some of the behind the scenes information of Exodus. As you uh, may or may not know, the purpose is to record the events of Israel's deliverance from Egypt and development as a nation. Uh, the author of Exodus is Moses. Good evening, Sister Legina. So good to see you joining us. The author of the book of Moses, as we discussed on last week, uh, Moses is credited for the first five books of the Bible, the entire Pentateuch or uh, the law of God. And so uh, Moses is considered to be the author of our book on tonight. It was written approximately 1400 to in 50 to 1410 BC, uh, approximately the same time as Genesis. Uh, and as we'll see, uh, the book of Exodus actually begins with the life of Moses. Uh, it begins very quickly uh, to dive into this young uh, leader being called by God. And this story of, Mo of, of Egypt's I mean, rather, of, of Israel's liberation, of Israel's deliverance, my brothers and sisters, is Moses' story. Uh, and so Moses begins to pen Genesis as the foundational body out of which he leads into this story of his showing up on the scene. Um, and so it's written approximately 450 to 410 of BC. The setting of this particular book is Egypt. That's important. Uh, the setting of this particular book is primarily Egypt. Uh, it happens in a place uh, that is known for black people. Amen. This it, it is the background, the backdrop of this particular uh, book of the Bible is Egypt. And Egypt is in northeastern Africa. Uh, as we've said from time to time, it is important to remember that uh, the Bible is primarily an African book uh, written about African folks to African people. Uh, and so we have here the children of, of Israel, God's chosen people, uh, spending over 400 years in Egypt. And so there's a lot of cross 
understanding of culture, of life, of the way of the world. Um, and so here, uh, this story of Exodus finds its backdrop in Egypt. And the key verse, the key verse, my brothers and sisters, and we're running on past these vital statistics. The key verse of, of Genesis, I mean of Exodus rather, is chapter 3, verse 7 uh, and verse 10. Chapter 3, verse 7 and verse 10. Allow me to read those to you. Uh, uh, from the NIV, it says, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard them crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. Listen to verse 10. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so this is why this is one of my favorite books of the Bible. Amen. It's because uh, it makes clear where God stands as it relates to freedom, as it relates to uh, liberation, as it relates to how God sees people in the world, even oppressed people in the world, and where God stands when it comes to people being oppressed in the world. And so Exodus is this book of liberation. Exodus is this this book of freedom, of, of God restoring God's people to a rightful place, of God delivering God's people. And that's good news tonight. My brothers and sisters, I don't know if you knew it, but Exodus has more miracles recorded than any other book of the Bible. Ah, that's good news tonight. So we're reminded, even in the foundation, even, even as we start in our vital statistics of Exodus, that God is a miracle worker. Somebody type in me tonight. God is a miracle worker. Exodus reminds us that God is in the miracle working business. Good evening, Reverend Higgins. God is in the miracle working business. It doesn't matter how long you've been bound. God is able to bring you out. That's good news tonight that God is able to deliver us from anything that might have us bound. Thank you, Sister, Sister Linda Thompson. God is a miracle worker. And so in the book of Exodus, God begins to reveal God's self to God's people and show up in new ways. Amen. And so we begin to understand the more, even through uh, Exodus, who God is to God's people in the world. And so the, let's let's jump into our framework tonight. Let's jump into our framework tonight on the book of Exodus. Amen. Let's jump into our framework on tonight. So the first thing that we must remember uh, my brothers and sisters, the first thing that we must uh, remember or come to know is that Exodus means outpouring. Exodus means outpouring. outpouring. And this is rooted in the out idea, rather, or not outpouring, but outgoing. Amen. Amen. I, I, miss, I misspelled it. Let me, let me correct that right there. Outgoing. <laughs> Amen. Got a little ahead of myself. Exodus means outgoing. And it has to do with the outgoing of the Israelites from the land of Egypt. It was written as was Genesis by Moses, and then it was confirmed by Christ in Luke chapter 24, verse 44. God will bring us out. Exodus is the book, my brothers and sisters, it is a book of redemption. It reminds us, it reminds us that God is our redeemer. The Israelites had been under the bondage of Egypt's ruler, Pharaoh, a ruler in Egypt. And Exodus describes how God delivered them from bondage. In Genesis, we saw the ruin of of man through the sin fall of man. In Exodus, we see the redemption by blood and the power of God. My brothers and sisters, Exodus 
uh, continues or expounds, if you will, upon what was started in Genesis. Exodus continues what was begun by God in Genesis 46 and 27, tells the number of the family of Jacob to be at 70. Stay with me. And approximately 400 years later, a vast multitude, 600,000 men plus women and children came up out of Egypt in Exodus chapter 12, verse 37. Let me give you those verses right there. So in, 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 in Genesis, it begins to record the, the birth of this nation all the way through Exodus chapter 12, verse 37, where we see how God's promise that, that the nation of Israel would be multiplied and blessed begins to come into fruition. Everything that God told Abraham was going to happen with his seed began to happen. They began to be counted with the sands and the stars, my brothers and sisters. The, they were, they, the numbers were multiplied just as God had promised over in Genesis, in Genesis 15 and 13. In Genesis 15 and 13 uh, says the seed of Abraham would spend 400 years in Egypt and Exodus 12 and 40, my brothers and sisters, Exodus 12 and 40 says it was 430 years in Galatians chapter 3 verses 16 and 17 uh, confirm that this was true. It was 430 years from the call of Abraham. And I need us to remember the vastness of the Exodus, what God does in the book of Exodus. It's a big deal. It's a, it's a big deal on how God brings them out. So let us look at uh, let's go a little deeper. Let's go a little deeper with this with this framework. Let's go a little a little deeper with this framework. So, when we look at how the book of Exodus is built, uh, chapters 1 through 18 actually describe the actual Exodus. Uh, the second part of the book deals with the law that God gives to Moses in chapters 19 through 24. In chapters 19 through 24, and then the third section deals with the tabernacle in chapters 25 through 40. And so in the Exodus section, we begin to see the power of God. We begin to see the power of God being made manifest in the life of Israel as God delivers them. God shows up in a series of plagues to bring them out. And not only do we see the power of God in that first uh, section in the Exodus, my brothers and sisters, but we also uh, see brought out to a new life that God brings them out of their shackles to a new life that God desires, uh, a sister Oliver, God desires to deliver us into a new life. And so we began to see this, this idea that God brings new life. Not only that, but that God also brings liberty. So the Exodus shows us the power of God, that God brings us out to new life, and that God will give us liberty. Then we get into the section, second section uh, that, that deals with the law, that deals primarily with the law, my brothers and sisters. And in that section uh, on, on the law, uh, we see, number one, the holiness of God. We see the holiness of God. It, it reveals to us how God has standards that are different from the world, how God has standards that are higher and better than the world's standards. Not only that, but in the second section, we're brought under the law. We're brought 
into covenant through the law. The law is a covenant. And once you know the law, you have a responsibility to live the law. And so God reveals his holiness through the law and they're brought under the law once the law is revealed to them, which leads to a certain level of responsibility. My brothers and sisters, when we come into a knowledge of what God is doing in the world, it brings us to a new level of responsibility, which brings us to the third section of the book of Exodus, which deals with the tabernacle. It deals with the tabernacle, which teaches us three things. It teaches us about, first of all, the wisdom of God and how God has a plan. Because the tabernacle is a, uh, a forerunner or rather a forevision, if you will, of Christ in the world. And we'll talk about that a little later tonight. But the tabernacle reveals the wisdom of God to know that the people of God need to know that God is present. That's good news tonight. The tabernacle is a reminder that God is an ever-present help for us in a time of trouble, not because God will, will come, but because God is already there. That's good news tonight, that God is with us. I said God is with us. And so we see uh, through the tabernacle, we see first of all the wisdom of God, and then we see a new love and fellowship that God is bringing them into. We begin to see that God has a plan for how God desires to be worshipped, for how God desires to be loved, for how God desires to be in relationship, my brothers and sisters. And then finally, uh, the tabernacle has to do with the new privilege because we understand through the tabernacle that we have a relationship with God, that we have access to God, that God is with us and that God will give us access. That, that is what we begin to understand when we understand why God gave the tabernacle. Amen. Amen. Can I go a little deeper tonight? <laughs> Amen. I understand this is a deep dive. Let's go a little bit deeper. In uh, uh, the Exodus in, in chapters 1 through 18, the first thing that we see, the first thing that we see is that God is a deliverer. God is a deliverer. Why? Because the book of Exodus opens up with the birth of Moses in 40 years in the palace. When you read the book of Exodus, it's in Exodus chapter 2, uh, you begin to see that God has a plan for restoring God's people. God allows one of the Hebrews to have a baby to end up in Pharaoh's palace, to be raised by Pharaoh's daughter, to eventually know all of the ways of Egypt, to, to, to be raised as an Egyptian, until finally one day uh, he gets offended at something that an Egyptian does to a Hebrew. He ends up killing one of the Egyptians, and Moses has to flee to Midian when he is 40 years old. But the good news is that God was raising up a deliverer. And then in Exodus chapter three, in Exodus chapter three, and you got to read this book. Now you got to, you got to read it. This is just an, an overview. But in Exodus chapter three, we have the call of Moses after some 40 years in Midian, after 40 years of Moses being in Midian. One day he is in, uh, he's out, he's tending his father-in-law's flocks and the record is that he sees a bush burning, but the bush is not being consumed. And so Moses takes off his shoes because he realizes that the ground he is walking on is holy ground. Where are my Bible readers tonight? And Moses begins to have a conversation with God and God tells Moses 
that I want you to go down to Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. So God is raising up a deliverer. While his people are suffering, his people are crying out to him. God is not, God is not, uh, allow his people to be absent of the trouble, but God shows up once they start crying. God shows up once they start calling out to him, and we see that God has a plan to raise up a leader, a deliverer. So by the time we get to Exodus chapter 4, the, the announcement of deliverance for Israel is being made known. God, Moses has gone to Pharaoh to let him know that God wants you to let my people go. And then in chapters 5 through 11, Pharaoh ends up having to deal with nine plagues because he will not let God's people go, my brothers and sisters. And so while Pharaoh wanted to be hard-hearted, God decided to send down nine plagues. First, God uh, allowed uh, the river to turn into blood and the fish died. The river smelled and the people were without water. Then God allowed the city to be overcome with frogs. The frogs come up from the water and completely covered the land. And then God sent nets down and all of the dust of Egypt became a massive swarm of nets. Then God sent flies and swarms of flies covered the land. My brothers and sisters, are you listening to me? God was showing up for God's People, that still wasn't enough. And so finally, God struck the livestock and all of the Egyptian livestock began to die. But none of Israel's was even sick, my brothers and sisters. God allowed boils to come on everyone in Egypt. And that still wasn't enough. And then God sent down hail and hailstorms killed all the slaves and animals left out of unprotected. Uh, then God sent locusts and, the, and locusts covered Egypt and began to eat everything left after the hail. And then God sent darkness and total darkness covered Egypt for three days so no one could even move about the city. Why? Because God shows up for God's people if he has to even turn nature upside down and move beyond the natural into the supernatural. What am I saying? God will do the supernatural in order to deliver us. <laughs> That's good news tonight. God will do the supernatural to deliver us, to bring us out. God did what needed to be done in order to bring his people out. So we see these nine plagues. We, the final plague is that final plague of the death of the firstborn. All of that did not move Pharaoh until finally God said, I've got to send the death angel into the city. And so what I want you all to do is to take the blood of the lamb for all of the children of Israel. And I want you to take the blood and mark it over the doorpost. And I'm going to send the death angel into the city. And when I send the death angel into the city, if he comes to your house and he sees the blood at your house, he's going to pass over your house. And that's when God instituted the Passover. And the only thing that could prevent the death angel from coming into your house was you had to have the blood, my brothers and sisters. Oh my God, tonight, that was a, a, a forevision of, of what God was going to accomplish through Jesus Christ on Calvary. It is the blood that secures our salvation. It's the blood that keeps us the safe. It is the blood that we need over the doorpost. It's the blood we need over our families. It is the blood that protects. And we see the deliverance by power and the blood. So in the text, we see deliverance by power and the blood. The institution of the Passover is this 10th plague, the death 
of the first born, first born, the death of the first born son. See First Corinthians chapter five, verse seven. Then we see them, my brothers and sisters, being finally released by Pharaoh. After God showed up and God demonstrated God's power that these people were not by themselves. That's good news tonight, Mount Olive. Listen, I want you to know we're not in this battle by ourselves. I, I see it. I see you, Sister T. That's it. I know it was the blood for me. <laughs> I know it was the blood for me. That's it, Sister D. There is power in the blood, there's power. And yeah, Sister Carolyn Williams, the blood still works. The blood still works. And so we see in this text, we see in this text deliverance by blood and by power, by the fact that God shows up for God's people. And, and, and finally, Pharaoh has to let them go, Reverend Higgins. <laughs> Pharaoh has to let them go, and after he lets them go, he decides he changed his mind. Look, I, 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 I messed up. They, I, I was, I got ahead of myself. As a matter of fact, I'm gonna send my army out, and we're going out, and we're going to bring them back. And so the story is, the record is that they get to the Red Sea, Sister Richardson. They get to the Red Sea. Uh, and, and, and the children of Israel got the Red Sea in front of them. They got mountains on both sides. They got Pharaoh and his army pursuing them on their tracks. They get to the Red Sea and, and, and they begin to, to cry out to God. Moses cries out and talks to God and he stretches out his rod and God parts the Red Sea. And then God's allowed them to go through on dry land. And then when each the Egyptians pursued them into the Red Sea. The record is that they were drowned. Pharaoh and his army were drowned in the Red Sea by the strength and the hand of our mighty God. My brothers and sisters, God will fight our battles. We're not in this thing alone. This battle that you're facing, this battle that wants to hold you back, I want you to know tonight that you are not alone and that this battle is not yours. It's the Lord's. <laughs> The battle is not yours, it is the Lord. And so then we see them after crossing the Red Sea, my brothers and sisters, we see them marching to, to Mount Sinai. We see them singing the song of the redeemed in Exodus chapter 15. God provided for 40 years. God provided for them. God provided fresh water from a smitten rock uh, for them. God provided for them. The bitter water was made sweet for them in uh, in chapter 15, verse 25. God made bitter water sweet in order to provide for them. What are you saying? That everything that they needed in their journey, God provided for them. Where God guides, God will provide where God takes us. We can trust him. God is with us. God is with us for 40 years after they leave their former land of Egypt and they leave the, 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 what that which they know my brothers and sisters when they, when they leave that, uh, uh, God provides for them. So, chapters 19 through 24. In chapters 19 through 24, we have the giving of the law. The law of God. I need us to understand tonight that God has laws. God has laws. We start out by discovering the commandments of God which govern moral life. In Exodus 19 and 20, at the foot of Sinai, the people agreed to the covenant at Sinai in Exodus 19 and 8. We note the Ten Commandments that are given, given to govern, give, govern our moral life, if you will. 
And then we find the judgments of God in this book, the judgments which govern social life and masters and servants in chapter 21 and property rights in chapter 22 and Sabbath and feast in chapter 23. And then it goes on to give us the laws that are considered the ordinances which govern religious life, which govern the sacred spaces of our lives, all taught in the giving of the tabernacle. So why was the law given? Why was the law given? That is the question. Why did God give Moses the law after he brought his people up out of the land? Why did God give them a law? God gave them the law, my brothers and sisters, number one, to provide a standard of righteousness. To provide a standard of righteousness. Our God has standards of righteousness. Yeah. In other words, with God, there is a, such a thing as a moral absolute. In other words, it's, it's, there, there's, there is right and there is wrong. And it's not all relative. Amen. And God is clear in his law on what the standards of righteousness are to look like. He's clear on what the standards of righteousness are to look like. It was added to the Abrahamic covenant. It was an insertion and not a deletion because of transgression. Grace is added. Galatians chapter 3. Uh, verses 17 and 18, Galatians chapter 3. Matter of fact, let's go ahead and read that. Let me turn over there. Galatians uh, chapter 3. Amen. I know it's a deep dive. Stay with me. Galatians chapter 3, uh, verses 17 and 18. What I mean is this. The law introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise for in the inheritance depends on the law, then it is no longer depends on a promise. But God in his grace gave it to Abraham through a promise. What then was the purpose of the law? It was added because of transgressions unto the seed to whom the promise referred had come. The law was put into effect through angels by a mediator. A mediator, however, does not represent just one party, but God is one, my brothers and sisters. And so God gives us the law as a schoolmaster. Somebody type schoolmaster tonight. The law is a schoolmaster. The law was given to Moses in order that we might know why we need God's grace. The law was given in order that we might know why we need God's grace, my brothers and sisters. And so the law is our schoolmaster. The law, uh, not only that, was given also to expose and identify sin. In Romans chapter 5, verse 20, in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, in Romans chapter 7, verse 7, the law is given in order that it might identify sin and expose sin in the world. My brothers and sisters, we've got to deal with sin. All of us have some sin in our lives that God is trying to reckon with. And so that what should that is what should keep us close to God. That is what should keep us in God's word. That is what should keep us praying unto God is because sin is a reality in the world. And no matter how much we want to talk about the blessings of God, we've got to deal with this sin nature that is tied to the flesh. Because the flesh has a sin nature. And God wants to deal with it. And so he gives us the law in order to expose and identify sin. We can't deal with that which we can't name, Sister Dent. You can't, you can't tame a demon that you can't name. In order to tame that thing, you got to be able to name it. And if you can name it, you can tame it. And so the law teaches us how to name the sin. 
Mm. It reveals to us God's holy standard and God's righteousness. We got to deal with the sin. And it also in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 32 through 36, it was given to us to reveal the holiness and the power of God. The law was given in order that we might know just how holy and righteous our God is, how far above God, our thoughts God really is, how, how, how different God's righteousness is from our own self-righteousness and from our own way of stinking thinking and rationale. And so he gives us here, he gives us, my brothers and sisters, uh, his way of holiness and reveals to us the power of God. We see also in this particular text, we begin to see the symbol of presence and holiness. God is with them in the cloud and the fire that God is with them. Amen. That God is with them. That God is with them in a pillar of fire by night in a pillar of cloud by day, God is with them. Amen. So it begins to show us, as I said, many miracles are demonstrated in the book of Exodus in order that God's people might understand just how close God desires to be with us. And then in the final section, uh, the book of Exodus deals with the tabernacle, the tabernacle in chapters 25 through 40. It deals with the tabernacle. And so we're given, we're given, if you will, we're given a pattern. Uh, the pattern was given to Moses during his 40 days on the mountain in chapter 25 through 31. God told him everything about it, how to build it, what to build it with, when to use it, how to use it, God gives Moses very detailed instructions about the tabernacle is because the tabernacle was going to be the place that God resided with the children of Israel. And so the tabernacle was basically this big uh, a tent, if you will, this, this portable tent that Israel would take with them along their journey and in the middle of that tent was a place uh, where God would reside with them. And so God gives them very specific, God gives Moses very specific instructions on what the tabernacle was to look like in chapters 25 through 31. And then after all of this, Israel lapses into idolatry. Now imagine it. God has brought them. God has brought them, my brothers and sisters, out of Egypt land. God brought them through the Red Sea. They saw all of the miracles God did in order to bring them out. And yet here they are finally at the, the mountain and Moses is up on the mountain talking to God. And they finally got time to breathe. And the first thing that they do is they get all of the gold together and they create a golden calf in the image of one of the Egyptian gods. And they began to worship a false god. They lapse back into the familiar in spite of the fact that God brought them back. They backslide. They slide back. They go back to their old ways. They go back to their old thinking and, and they, their old practices and they slide back. My brothers and sisters, and Moses has to deal with his own anger management issues. God uh, gives them the law all over again. And then finally in chapters uh, 35 through 40, Finally, the temple is completed and erected exactly one year after the Exodus in Exodus chapter 40, verse 2, and the glory of the presence of God descends upon it. After 
They do what God tells them to do and build God's house the way that God tells them to build it. A sister Dent, God shows up and God blesses the house with God's presence. <laughs> and they get to experience the Shekinah glory of God as God's presence fills the house. As God uh, fills the house. I think that is interesting to note that the scripture devotes more room to the tabernacle than any other subject. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. Let's look at that right fast. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. Let me read that to you. And it says this, it was necessary then for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, my brothers and sisters. And so God gave them a way of offering sacrifices because it was necessary. It was necessary. What the, the, what, the tabernacle does is lay the foundation for what Christ does in Christ's sacrifice. So the tabernacle is designed in the plan of God to teach us some deep spiritual truths, Sister D. Uh, it's designed to teach all the truths would take many lessons, but the important thing is to remember that God taught and still teaches according to this pattern. And so uh, we have here the way to God, that God shows us how God wants to be present with God's people. Even after they fall, my brothers and sisters, God wants to be present with God's people. God wants to show up for them. God wants to be present for them. God wants uh, them to experience God's presence. And so God does everything that needs to be done in order to restore God's people. And that's good news tonight. It's good news that God desires to be in relationship with us. It's good news tonight. Let me give us, let me give us a few uh, uh, mega things, and we're gonna get ready to get out of here tonight. We're gonna get ready to get out of here. Let me give us a few mega mega things, and uh, we'll get ready to get out of here tonight. Let's see here. So. We cannot talk about this book without talking about bondage, without talking about Exodus, without talking about the wilderness experience. And my brothers and sisters, it would be hard to overstate the central importance of the Exodus experience for Israel's understanding of itself and of its faith. We cannot talk about Israel without talking about Exodus because how they understand their relationship with God is tied to their deliverance. I just said something tonight. How Israel understands their relationship with God is tied to their deliverance. And my brothers and sisters, if you have ever been bound and God delivers you, you have a testimony to God's power that nobody can take from you. you you'll have a story uh, that, that the angels cannot sing. Some of us know that, that, that it was God that brought us out. And because of that, we got a different way of praising. We got a, we got a different story because God is a part of our story. God is the reason we've been delivered. God is the reason that we can love our enemies. God is the reason, my brothers and sisters, that we just want to help somebody so that our living is not being in vain because our minds have been freed from the thinking of this world that it's all about us and we realize that it's all about him and how we treat others. And so 
uh, the central themes, these central themes of the book uh, of Exodus have to do with their bondage, with their exodus and with the wilderness experience that God does not desire to see us bound. I, I, want, I want us to get there tonight. God does not desire to see us bound. And if you're bound, God wants you to have a breakthrough tonight. <laughs> if you're bound, God desires that you have a breakthrough. God desires that you have a breakthrough. Let me say something about this. Let me say something about this theological thing. This book is about the experience of abundance, liberation, and covenant community and the presence of God's glory in our midst in every generation of God's people. So in this particular text in Exodus, we discover that even in our bondage, God hears our cries even while we're going through. God is with us. God is concerned about us. And even if we don't know it, God is working out a plan in order to deliver us. God is on our side. When you look at the ways of the world, it's important for us to understand that in this particular book, God shows up on the side of the oppressed over and against the oppressor. We live in a world that tells us that God is on the side of the oppressor against the oppressed. But here in the book of Exodus, God shows up for those that are being oppressed and downtrodden to show them that God was on their side, my brothers and sisters. And so we see uh, oppression as historical context. We cannot talk about the book of Exodus without talking about oppression and how God is against oppression. If we read the book of Exodus and over-spiritualize it and miss the fact that God's people were being physically oppressed and God moved in the supernatural in order to free them, then we have over-spiritualized the text. What is happening is that God's people are struggling. Oppression has overtaken God's people and God shows up for those that are being held down. Good God from Zion. The book of Exodus is not a history writing. The book of Exodus is not just a book on history. The book of Exodus is kerygma. Kerygma, K-E-R-Y-G-M-A, it's kerygma. That is, the book is theological proclamation seeking to tell the community's salvation story to subsequent generations so that they too will know and encounter the liberating God of the Exodus story. And so the reason we have the book of Exodus is so that we will know that God liberated people back then and God is able to liberate us even today and do it all over again. The book of Exodus is handed down from generation to generation so that generations coming will know that our God is a liberator, that our God is a deliverer. He's a very present help in a time of trouble. There can be no doubt that the Exodus story assumes an originating series of events in the past, but the concern of the text is with the ongoing theological meaning of the events, not with the historical details of the original context. What are you saying? The Exodus story is about the fact that God is delivering them right then, right there from the people that they are being oppressed by. In other words, God is for our freedom. God is working for our freedom. Even when we don't see it, even when we don't know it. And then we have this self-disclosure of God. And so in reading the book of Exodus, this is a self-disclosure of God. This is God showing us who God is 
to us. God, God's revelation of God's self that I will show up, that I rule and super rule over nature. Whatever needs to be done in order to free you, I can do it because I, the Lord, your God, am for you. And so we get a self-disclosure of God. We learn something new about God. Not only is God our creator like he was in Genesis, but God is our redeemer. God will redeem us. When we are bound, we learn something about God. We learn a new name for God. We learn that God is Adonai. God is Adonai, which means the Lord, which comes out of Yahweh. See, Yahweh was so holy, so righteous that they didn't want to call God uh, Yahweh which was tied to the, the I am statement Who, when Moses said, who should I say sent me down to, to Egypt? Whose authority shall I say sent me? And God said, tell them I am sent you. Tell them I am that I am have sent you. In other words, I, I am able to do. I'm the one that did and so it is done. I'm the creator and the sustainer of heaven and earth. We learn something new about who our God is in the book of Exodus. God is Adonai. He, he's the Lord. I know I know that the world wants us to think that, that Pharaoh is the Lord, that the president is the Lord, that, that Putin is the Lord, but, but this Bible teaches us that there is only one Lord our God that and he sits high and looks low. Are y'all praying with me tonight? His name is Adonai, which comes from Yahweh, which means to be. And so we have this self-disclosure of God. We learn more about who God is and what God is able to do. You know, we, we, we discover in the book of Exodus that God specializes in things impossible. Oh, I just said something right there. God, God specializes in things impossible. We see all of these miracles. Any way you want to bless me, Lord, <laughs> I will be satisfied. And then we discover, we discover that God's salvation is liberation. We discover in the book of Exodus that God's salvation is liberation. When God is saving God's people in the book of Exodus, he is not talking to them about some level of morality. He's not talking about their change in their behavior. When God is talking about salvation in the book of Exodus, he is talking about bringing them out. He is talking about their freedom. He is talking about their physical liberation and the chains being broken, falling from their hands and falling from their feet. And so we have, we have these mega things. We have these mega things, and I'm ready to get out of here tonight. Somebody type slavery. Somebody type slavery. Somebody... Type slavery for me. We're getting ready to get out of here. The Israelites were slaves for 400 years. Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, oppressed them cruelly. They prayed to God for deliverance from this system. And God showed up and delivered them. Somebody type slavery. So we discover where God is on slavery. Number two, somebody type rescue. Come on, type rescue. I see y'all. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Somebody type rescue tonight. Rescue. God rescued Israel through the leader Moses and through mighty miracles. The Passover celebration was an annual reminder of the escape from slavery. In other words, God delivers us from slavery, from the slavery of sin. Jesus Christ celebrated the Passover with his disciples at the Last Supper and then went on to rescue us from sin by dying in our place. God rescued us. Somebody type guidance, guidance, guidance. God guided Israel out of Egypt by using the plagues. God guided them out by Moses' heroic courage. God guided them through the miracle of the Red Sea. God guided them by giving them the Ten Commandments. God is a trustworthy guide. God will guide us. 
Although God is all powerful and can do miracles, he normally leads us by wise leadership and team effort. His words give us the wisdom to make daily decisions and govern our lives. Somebody type 10 commandments, 10 commandments, 10 commandments, 10, 10, 10 commandments. God's law system had three parts. The Ten Commandments were the first part containing the absolutes of spiritual and moral life. The silver law was the second part giving the people rules to manage their lives. The ceremonial law was the third part showing them patterns for building the tabernacle and regular worship. In other words, God was teaching Israel the importance of choice and responsibility. When they obeyed the conditions of the law, he blessed them. But if they disobeyed, he punished them or allowed calamities to come into their life. Many great countries of the world base their laws on the moral systems set up in the book of Exodus. God's moral law is still valid today. Listen, the 10 are still valid today. Even though we're under grace, we still have the big 10, the big 10, <laughs> the 10 commandments. And then finally, the nation. The nation, somebody type the nation, the nation, the nation. God founded the nation of Israel to be the source of truth, and the salvation to all the world. His relationship to his people was loving yet firm. The Israelites had no army, no schools, no governors, no mayors or police when they left Egypt. God had to instruct them in their constitutional lives, in their daily practices. He showed them how to worship and how to have national holidays. God showed them how to be a people. God guided them in being a people that was called by his name, my brothers and sisters. And so we have some major mega themes there in the book of Exodus. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for sharing with us tonight. I pray that something has been said or done that has blessed you uh, in this overview. <laughs> we covered a lot of ground tonight. This overview of the book of Exodus. God bless each and every one. And listen, let me give you a couple of next steps tonight. Uh, if you've got questions or comments, you can contact us. You can call us at 501-663-7974. You can email those questions in to mountoutoflittlerock at gmail.com. We would love to hear from you. Before next week, let's take the time and read the book of Leviticus and prepare for next week's discussion. Uh, that means you need to read about four chapters each day in order to stay ahead uh, and be prepared for uh, the overview. Review Exodus from the notes you took tonight. I pray you were taking notes on tonight. And uh, of course, I pray that you'll be present next Wednesday, ready for the study of Leviticus. Amen. Amen. I look forward to seeing you all back on next Wednesday. Listen, it is praying time tonight. Um, if you have prayer requests, go ahead and place those in the comments. We want to pray for you on tonight. Amen. We want to pray for you on tonight. We want to pray for you on tonight. Let us pray on tonight. Let us pray. Most gracious and eternal God, our deliverer, Lord, we thank you tonight for being our deliverer. Thank you for bringing us out for bringing us through, for breaking chains. God, we thank you tonight for just how far you have brought us. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for your guidance tonight. God, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for your laws. We thank you for your precepts. We thank you for your ways on tonight. God, we honor you on tonight. And Lord, we come praying and looking to you in times like these, in times of trouble, God, we come praying and looking to you, trusting, oh God, that you are able to make a difference. So God, we come tonight, we come lifting up uh, the daughter of Sister Linda Barton, Tanisha. God, we pray that you would touch her, that you would be with her at this time, and that you would minister to her like only you can. God, we thank you. 
We thank you in advance for what you are going to do in her life. God, we come tonight praying for the McDavid family. Lord, we lift them up to you. Lord, you know their names. You know what they're standing in need of. And so, God, we come to you right now. God, just asking that you would touch like only you can. In the name of Jesus, God, touch tonight. Father, we come praying right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you would move in a mighty way. God, in the name of Jesus, we come saying thank you now, God. Thank you for hearing our cries. Thank you for hearing our calls. God, we lift up the Vaughn family tonight. God, we pray that you would wipe away the tears from their eyes in, the, in this time of bereavement. God, we come praying tonight. Lord, we lift up uh, baby Michael on tonight. Continue to strengthen him in his journey. And Lord, we just come praying that you would continue to bless him like only you can. God, we thank you for his witness. We thank you for what you're doing in his life. God, we come praying for uh, the son of Sister Shirley Denton tonight. We come praying that you would continue to strengthen them in their time of bereavement. Continue to be with them. And God, we give you all of the praise. We give you all of the honor. We give you all of the glory for the things that you have done in our lives. And God, we bless and magnify your high and holy name. God, we honor you in this time and space. God, we lift up our elected officials tonight. We lift up heads of state everywhere. We lift up uh, those that are on the front lines. God, we lift up this COVID-19 to you tonight. God, in the name of Jesus, touch all of these variants and bless all of the healthcare workers. Lord, Lord, we pray tonight. We pray for the next generation. We pray for our children tonight. Continue to cover them in the classroom and keep their schools safe. Lord, we come praying for administrators on tonight. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we just pray for your covering. Cover God. Cover the Mount Olive Church tonight. Cover everyone that is watching, God. And Lord, I just say thank you now. And I give you all of the praise. God, I give you all of the honor right now in the name of Jesus. God, I give you the glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. God, I give you the glory in the name of Jesus. God, I bless your name right now, Lord. Lord, I thank you for what you are doing in the lives of our seasoned saints right now, God. I thank you for blessing our mothers. I, I thank you for protecting them and giving them more time. God, we thank you for that light this evening that is still shining bright. And Lord, we pray right now for Mother Scoggins. God, we pray right now for Mother McLemore. God, we pray for Mother Nancy Deadman. Lord, in the name of Jesus, touch them. Lord, I, I pray for our associate ministers on tonight. And God, I pray for Reverend Higgins. Continue to bless him. Continue to to allow him to recover, God. And I thank you right now for his 100% recovery. Lord, in the name of Jesus. And God, I lift up Sister Deborah Shelton tonight. I, I lift up Sister Legina tonight. Lord, touch yeah, God in the name of Jesus. I, I thank you for healing right now, God. I, I thank you that it's happening right now, God. I thank you in the name of Jesus. God, I come praying. I lift up. Prophet is fight for tonight. Lord, touch your body. Touch your body, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, I know that you're able, God. And Lord, I just say thank you now, God. Thank you, God. Oh, I give you the glory, God. We give you the praise. We give you the honor, God, for your healing power. God, we say thank you in advance, God. Thank you for being a healer, God. In the name of Jesus, God, we say thank you. Oh, God, we bless you tonight. 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 Lord, we lift up Mother Norma Young right now. God, touch her, God. In the name of Jesus, God, touch God. Oh, God. And we say thank you, Lord. 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 In the name of Jesus, God. Bless everybody that's on. And then, Lord, I pray for deliverance tonight. God, deliver tonight. God, anybody that's bound, I pray for deliverance right now in the name of Jesus, God. God, deliver minds tonight. Deliver hearts tonight. Deliver spirits tonight in the name of Jesus. God, do like you did in the book of Exodus. Bring your people out, God, in the name of Jesus. 
God, break every chain right now, God. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And we give you all of the glory. We give you all of the honor. We give you all of the praise, Lord. And we say thank you now, God. Thank you now, God. Yes, God, we bless you. 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 In the name of Jesus. God, we thank you. Hey! In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Hey! Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the victory. Thank you for breakthrough tonight. Thank you for deliverance. <laughs> In the name of Jesus. Hey. Listen, family, I love you. I love you. I love you. And there ain't nothing that you can do about it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Until next time, peace.